Well, hello, everyone. Um, welcome. My name is Rob Eschman. I'm the national editor of The Forward. I'm really thrilled you could all be here today um, to take part in this um, forward forum on why can't we solve homelessness now. Um, this is the third of our four forward forums. We did one in Chicago and Florida. In about three weeks, we'll be doing one in Boston, um, all cities where the forward is expanding its footprint. Um, I just wanna start by thanking the people that put this together, um, Gabby Brooks, Roberta Kaplan, Dina Cooperman and Lisa Lepson. So they do all the heavy lifting. Um, like I said, we've done three of these so far. This one is um, closest to my heart because it's at my home, Los Angeles. And it's an issue, homelessness that I've written about that so many of us care about. Um, the uh, pan Long before the pandemic has hit LA, we've had an epidemic of homelessness. Um, 66,000 people in LA County, according to the last count, um, are experiencing homelessness. That's a 12.7% rise from last year. Um, the city of Los Angeles has a 16% rise to 41,000. So what we're going to do in the next hour, we all know that if we live in LA, we see it with our own eyes, our kids see it. It's, um, it's, just, a, it's, it's, it's just shameful. We all know that too. Um, but what we're going to do in the next hour is really look at solutions. We're going to keep this conversation as much as possible focused on how we could go forward, how we could help people get off the streets, get into housing. Um, what can we done that we haven't done so far? What can we do better that we have done so far? We're going to keep this very solutions oriented. It's going to be q and A. I'm going to introduce our speakers. We're going to have some questions. Um, we're going to have a conversation. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A, not in the chat. I will try to get to as many as possible. I'll incorporate them as we go along. Um, I already have gotten over a dozen, two dozen questions, um, pre-questions pre from our very, very involved audience. Um, we are waiting for one more person to join us, but, if, but we're gonna get started in the meantime, and I'm gonna start by introducing everybody. Um, first of all, uh, I want to welcome and thank uh, LA City Controller Ron Galperin for joining us. Ron, welcome. Thank you. Um, Dana Cuff, uh, Professor of Architecture and Urban Design and Urban Planting and Planning at UCLA. And she's also the director of City Lab, an award-winning think tank that advances experimental urbanism and architecture. She's published and lectured widely about spatial justice, architectural profession and affordable housing. Thank you so much for joining us, Dana. And uh, Rabbi Noah Farkas, who's not only the rabbi, a rabbi at Valley Beth Shalom in Encino, but he's a member of the Los Angeles Homeless, Commi Homeless Services Authority Commission, LAXA. Uh, um, and I will introduce our final speaker. She's our other speaker when she comes on. But why don't we, um, why don't we start with you, uh, Ron? Um, what's been really clear is that the pace of homelessness is just not, there, there's been a lot of good solutions. And I wanna give credit to people in government, yourself, people on the outside, uh, you know, people working within government like Rabbi and Dana, um, who have really come up with some solutions, some, some political, sol uh, political answers but we're not ahead of the problem. We keep falling behind the problem. And I, I, I just wanna get from you a sense of how do we get ahead of it? How do we get ahead of the problem in the coming year? Well, first of all, Rob, thank you so very much for uh, putting this together. Uh, I'm proud to say that I am a third generation subscriber to The Forward. Uh, I remember my grandparents and my father who uh, loved getting the, uh, the Yiddish Daily Forward and how you have transformed uh, The Forward for a new generation is really uh, amazing. And I think it's also really uh, appropriate that The Forward uh, and that we as a Jewish community come together to talk about uh, the importance of how do we address the crisis of homelessness. Uh, we are people who were 40 years in the wilderness as it were exemplified by, by the sukkah and uh, generations of exile and disbursement and diaspora and having to uh, be uh, homeless uh, as, a, uh, as a culture many times over the last millennia. So, uh, so with that, uh, I, I think that we have to, uh, first of all, 
see the urgency of this. Uh, there, there are too many people, unfortunately, who, even though they have very good intentions, uh, I don't feel the urgency for them to address this uh, as it really needs to be addressed right at this moment. Uh, we had a thousand people who died on our streets on the city of Los Angeles last year. The estimate is that it may be 1300 people this year in a city with so much wealth and with so much uh, prosperity that that should be happening, even if it's COVID is utterly unacceptable. I think we also have to stop making uh, the uh, perfect the enemy of the good and we have to look at how we got here. Uh, I think about the many regulations that we have in California when it comes to uh, building and uh, to planning and to construction to uh, preserve our environment and to mitigate traffic and prevent overdevelopment and ADA compliance and prevailing wages, all outstanding uh, things that we have, but they have made it very difficult, very time consuming to get anything built. You look uh, also at, for example, the recent tiny homes that Los Angeles is starting uh, with at a cost of $130,000 per tiny home, 10 times what they're spending in Riverside, Santa Cruz, and in other places. Well, let me, let me interrupt you there because that was one of my questions. So why? I mean, I, I read that article in the LA Times. Why are we spending 10 times more for these tiny homes? And uh, the, 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 let's start there. Right. Uh, part of it is uh, an overwhelming bureaucracy. Uh, part of it is the inclination of government that it's much easier to say no than it is to say yes. You're never going to be punished uh, for saying no, but you may very well be punished for saying yes when you are uh, within government. Um, and it is uh, making the uh, perfect the enemy of the good in that um, you want to do it right. Uh, but you add the costs of site preparation and utilities and concrete pads and alarms and permits and fees uh, and sewer connections and design and inspection, all of which are, are good things, but you're comparing that to people who are living and rather dying on the street. So how do we provide things that are imperfect, admittedly, uh, at least in the interim to get people off the street and to get them uh, the help that they so desperately need and to help our communities that are uh, dealing with this crisis as well. I wanna bring our other speakers into this. Um, both of you, Dana and, and Rabbi Farkas, um, why, it, it took a while, it took till March actually of this year for the mayor to say, let's try this tiny homes approach. Let's just get people off the street into housing. Before that, it was a lot of the focus seemed to be on getting permanent supportive housing or long-term housing. Um, do, you, do you think that's the right approach to just get people off the street into these tiny homes? Is that the best approach for now? Um, Professor Cuff, why do you go first? Well, uh, absolutely. I mean, basically, there's no single solution that's going to solve this with the urgency that Ron was talking about. So we have to have what I consider a continuum of accommodation. No one wants to see overnight parking as a housing solution, no one. But it may be the least expensive, most immediate way of getting unhoused neighbors into safer or warmer conditions. And we ought to be allowing that. The state, again, I think somewhat like what Ron was saying about the bureaucracy, the state has ordinances that now allow uh, overnight parking, but they're not very adequate and they get a lot of resistance and the NIMBY fa factors always play in. But I think tiny houses, uh, adaptive reuse of motels and hotels, which we've been trying, housing construction, finding land that we can utilize that uh, reduces the land cost. Right now, we're working on uh, with the California School Board Association to try to get school lands that are underutilized, uh, dedicated permanent affordable housing. Um, and there are many other ways in that spectrum uh, to, to deliver housing. But uh, let me just add one more thing and maybe the rabbi would have something more to say about this. I also think we really need community organizing like they have in Minneapolis, the Neighbors for More Neighbors program that we start seeing our unhoused neighbors as citizens and residents along with the people who are housed and start looking for solutions that really build constituencies for affordable housing 
and not uh, antagonism toward it. And it's going to take a kind of civil rights movement uh, around housing, I think, to begin to shape a new attitude about housing our unhoused neighbors. Thank you, uh, Rabbi. Yeah, thank you, uh, Rob. Uh, it's good to be here. I, I too am a second generation uh, subscriber to the forward. So I've uh, been very glad to be part of this panel and to be with uh, with experts. I don't consider myself an expert. I, I got into organizing around homelessness because I met someone who was homeless and uh, their uh, suffering moved me enough to move my congregation. And I was lucky enough to be appointed as a government commissioner, but I don't speak on behalf of the government. In fact, uh, Sheila Kuehl, the county supervisor who appointed me, wants me to be on the outside looking in. And that's why our relationship, Sheila and mine, is so powerful is because I'm able to push her at the right moments just as she pushes me. Um, I think that a lot of what's been said here is true. Uh, there is a over a burden of building and environmental regulations when it comes to housing that has prevented us from building housing rapidly enough. And I think that um, I think that there does need to be an additional community organizing effort to uh, to see our unhoused neighbors as neighbors. And that to me is part of our Jewish story too, is that um, that uh, we have to understand what it means to have a homeless heart and we have to understand that we see each, each individual person as, um, as created in the image of God. I mean, the 66,000 people is more than fits into Dodger Stadium during the World Series. And I don't just mean uh, COVID-19 World Series. I mean, you know, the general population that can fit into Dodger Stadium at an oversold game. And so if you think about that and you think every single one of those people is looking for a place to live, this epidemic of homelessness is truly a crisis. Um, I think that a couple of things that are also important, the focus on permanent supportive housing was right th the right focus at the time. Uh, and mostly that's because building those units is, is quite difficult, but it's something as part of the solution. I'm glad that we're pivoting away from that as a focus, knowing that measure H and HHH are in place um, and now looking at a whole continuum of care. Although I will say that I am not and I will never be a long-term fan of temporary solutions like Project Room Key, because when temporary solutions become permanent solutions, all we've done is crystallize or ensconce homelessness in our city and not uh, eliminate it. And to me, to me, Rob, and we can circle back to this, but homelessness is a symptom of the problem, not the problem itself. Homelessness is the temperature we take as a city or as a society for how well we take care of each other. And the no higher number of people who are unhoused, the higher our temperature is. And we're experiencing, I think, a fever, uh, a really high fever. And so the solutions ultimately that will solve homelessness, solve this seemingly unsolvable problem, have more to do with poverty and racial disparity and the lack of housing in our particular continuum of care than they do specifically with having to uh, address homelessness itself. You pay I people back to the short-term versus long-term um, right. solutions, but I also want to introduce our, our other speaker here today. I'm so glad you um, got on here. Okay, Susan. Um, Susan Kolkowicz is an advocate for domestic uh, violence victims and homelessness. Um, she, you are a resident manager at the Downtown Women's Center and I'm really happy to welcome you. Uh, the voices of people who actually have experienced homeless are often left out of the discussions about how to solve homelessness. And so I wanted you to talk um, briefly, Susan, um, about your experience with homelessness, how you got into it and um, how you got out of it. So maybe you could share that with us right now. Um, thank you. Um, so lovely to be part of this uh, panel and uh, with the, the other esteemed speakers. Thank you for including me. Um, so I just wanted to, to say one thing to respond to um, what I've heard so far, which is that I look at homelessness, it's sort of the convergence of vulnerability. You know, there's a lot of different uh, things that feed it, you know, a lot of different, but it's the most vulnerable people in a very vulnerable situation. So. In any case, um, uh, I was, uh, you know, I, I worked, I was living a normal life. I grew up in a nice uh, suburb of a 
Los Angeles. And um, I uh, got into a relationship that became, uh, you know, domestic violence. And I exited the domestic violence into homelessness, uh, having never experienced anything uh, in terms of the social, um, you know, the uh, safety net other than let's say unemployment once. I didn't really know what it there was, what, what I could access, where it was. It was a um, very uh, difficult experience. I was, uh, I didn't know, you know, what to do or how to deal with it. And I soon found out that Department of Public Social Services is where you start. That's where you can get food stamps. And that's what I did. And I got referrals to, uh, you know, um, a, uh, the, a mental health uh, clinic, a, a county one, a county run clinic that helped me with, because I was already traumatized from the domestic violence. And there I was not, you know, having no place to stay and knowing not, not knowing what to do. And through, uh, through that, uh, it's the Edelman on the West side, the Edelman clinic at Olympic and um, Spoboda, that's where I went. They uh, helped me understand there was a woman's shelter in Santa Monica that um, could help me. And while I was not able to access the shelter services immediately, I, it was a place to start. Because prior to that, what I was dealing with, not knowing how to be homeless, is I was riding the bus every night. I had a loop, you know, I would take the 33 to downtown and take the four and um, it was awful because I don't know if anyone can really understand what it's like when you have nowhere to go and it's nine o'clock at night. And I was um, a fish out of water. I didn't know what to do. I did, every day was about survival. And, um, but the what I experienced ultimately was through a, a special mix of homeless service providers who helped me um, get out, get get into a transitional housing and ultimately permanent supportive housing. I I was able to finally be safe at night, finally regroup, and then participate back in society again. At get work. I work at the downtown women's center. I, um, I have a stable uh, home life. I, it was without permanent supportive housing, I don't know what I would have done. And so I don't want us to be too quick to ex to think that strategy, although expensive, uh, it, it needs to be, I believe the ultimate strategy because everyone needs a home, an apartment, a, a tiny home is a transition. I'm okay with it being transitional. I'm okay with any of these, rapid rehousing, all of that. As long as we understand, just like everybody else, people who've been homeless want to be in a, an apartment or a home. And lots of the people who are experiencing homelessness are not drug addicts and they're not mentally health, have mental illness. Uh, there are women like myself who experienced domestic violence and we had to escape it. It's people who, children, kids who time out of foster care. It's, um, people who are uh, experiencing handy, uh, experiencing a disability and cannot work. It's the elderly, it's, it's, there's a lot of people who don't fit that description that we see when we look at the tents in Skid Row because the most, the largest population of homeless people we don't see because they're living in their cars or they're couch surfing. They're going from friend to friend to, you know, wherever they can, and we don't see most homeless people. We see the most vulnerable. That's who we see on the street. But that is the vast majority are not like that. Thank you, Susan. Um, that's that's. Uh, I'm so happy that it you know that you that you found the help you needed. Ron, if it works, if 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 it worked for Susan, why can't we scale it up for the other? And, and you're going to laugh when I say this, but what's stopping us from scaling what worked for Susan up to sixty thousand more people? What are the, what's the big impediment? What do we need to do to, we helped Susan or society was able to get Susan off the street into housing, into permanent housing. Why can't we do that 60,000 more times? Or how long, why? I think that we can, I think that we must. And I think that it comes down to will. 
and uh, to a uh, focus on doing this. And also look, the uh, lens that I use in my role as controller and, and I'm elected to be the independent watchdog as it were for the people's money in Los Angeles is to quite frankly, call out others uh, within our city and within our county uh, to do an independent review and to, uh, to at least provide uh, the perspective of, of my office on how it is that we're spending money. And we have a lot of different efforts that uh, uh, are being undertaken, some more successful than others. You have a lot of people of very goodwill with great intentions, but we also have to be uh, willing and able to uh, look at what are we getting for the dollars that we spend and are we getting the results that we need. I, for example, happen to be a, a very big believer uh, in permanent supportive housing, but I'm also very troubled by the fact that it's now more than four years since the voters approved uh, measure Triple H, uh, which was supposed to create 10,000 permanent supportive housing units. Nobody expected that they would be done overnight, but here we are, uh, five units complete, uh, five projects completed with 284 units uh, completed. Uh, and the average cost is right now about $560,000 per unit, uh, and some units as much as $740. $7,000 a door. If that's what your cost is, then you're never going to have enough money to house enough people and to make enough of a dent in this. So I believe that we can do it, but we've got to have the will to do it. We've got to cut through so much of the BS, quite frankly, and the bureaucracy. Uh, and uh, we have to accelerate this. And look, housing is not the only answer, as we know. Uh, there's also so many other factors and there's a historic uh, 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 a pattern of, of racism that has fed into all of this. 70% of our homeless are, are people of color uh, in the Los Angeles area. Uh, there's also been an inattention to uh, mental health care and what a difference uh, that could make for so many people. Uh, so it's not just housing, but that's a very important component of it. And we've got to look at every dollar that we're spending and what are we getting for that money. And in many cases, I, I hate to say, as a controller, not enough. We should be able to achieve much more for the dollars that we're spending. Um, Professor Cuff, what's the, oh, you know, before we get to the permanent supporting housing part that Susan was talking about and the controller was talking about, what do you think is the best short-term temporary housing solution if we wanted to say, you know, we're going to, committed by 2021, we're going to have everybody in some kind of housing. What, what solutions have you seen? I just want to say that I, I came across you um, because I read about you in Los Angeles Magazine did a fabulous uh, piece in October looking at 14 innovative, they asked all these architectural firms to come up with great ideas for temporary and permanent housing for the homeless. And um, and you were mentioned in it. And, and I just thought, boy, that's thinking out of the box. So what do you think are some of the great ideas out there that, that Ron should take to the city government? Thanks. Uh, and I just wanna start by saying thanks to Susan for sharing that really powerful story. I think it's really important for all of us to hear those stories and they're not always easy to tell. So thank you so much. Um, you know, I think the housing first models or, you know, build it better models are really important. I, I totally agree with Susan that our end goal is supportive, permanent housing for people. But how do we get there, given everything Ron's talking about? Um, one way is to sort of find the housing that's hidden in plain sight. And right now, for instance, our office buildings are relatively empty. There are a lot of motels around the Los Angeles and California landscape that can be immediately repurposed and have been tried as part of the um, uh, project home key that the governor has set up. And I think all of these are really important. The Oakland uh, community cabins is a great uh, starting point. And generally what occurs is that when we get people into short-term housing, we are more responsible about moving them into long-term housing. So I don't think that there's an inconsistency between short-term and long-term housing. What um, 
we had been working on at my research design research center. And I, you know, I'm an architect, so I think about buildings a lot and how we get them into the you know whole economy of uh, affordable housing and housing solutions. Um, we found that some of the hidden in plain sight was in people's backyards. You know, in some neighborhoods in Los Angeles, two thirds of the property already have uh, informal housing in the back, little garage apartments and secondary units. And seeing this as a bottom up solution, we decided at City Lab, along with partners in Northern California and with our Congress uh, Assemblyman Richard Bloom, that we could write a bill to assure that people could by right build secondary units in their backyards. And that's been a help. There are 8 million single family homes in California. That's a lot of housing. Um, but when you asked, why can't we get all 60,000 people off the street now? It's different for cities like Abilene or uh, Bergen County, New Jersey, which have actually say they've ended homelessness. Their housing crisis is not nearly as extreme as ours here in Los Angeles. Los Angeles and San Francisco, as other major cities in the US have terrible housing crisis. And as we add ADUs, for example, this backyard homes, we're finding that the rents for those, even though a lot of them are small, are still too high. So it, it's adding housing, but it hasn't yet in terms of the market brought the rents down. And that's why we're now looking at public land as a means to become the sites for another whole set of affordable housing solutions that hopefully um, we can get state decisions that will allow neighborhoods to customize it, but not stop them. And I think that's another critical factor is that we need to intervene and have more conversations like the one with Susan so that people see that our unhoused neighbors are really our neighbors. I, I can't repeat that enough. When Venice, an activist progressive community blocks permanent supportive housing, we've done something really wrong and we need to change the narrative. Rabbi, that's a perfect segue to you because that's part of your job, your leadership job is changing narratives, establishing narratives. How do you, you know, what do you think is the most effective narrative to people who are NIMBY, to people who, you know, see homelessness just as kind of the other? And how do you get them on board with these kinds of bold projects? Yeah, thanks, Rob. And I, I think Dana said it really well. Um, I just want to point out a couple of things. Um, the way it is, is you tell stories. So I'm going to tell a story. The first thing is you should know is that in Los Angeles County, the homeless services continuum has taken 20,000 homeless individuals, people experiencing homelessness off the streets this year. The problem is not the system not being able to take people off the streets. It's that more people hit the streets every day than can be taken off, which means that the problem again is not homelessness itself, but it is a symptom of a larger problem that has to do with poverty, mental health, medical health, systemic racism, domestic violence, the foster care system, it touches every single aspect of society. And when we, when we, when you, the, uh, the, the vacancy rate, the last time I checked in Los Angeles for an apartment was somewhere around two to 4%, which means that the day that you tell your landlord that you're moving on, he's got four or she's got four or five applications for your apartment already in the filing cabinet, ready to take that apartment. So the issue is a, a, ma a massive housing crisis. Now, when it comes to changing narratives, you tell stories, which is why I'm glad Susan is here. Because when we talk about human beings experiencing homelessness as objects and numbers and statistics and not human beings that had a mother and a father or folks who have uh, striven and uh, failed in certain ways or were victims in many ways, then what we're doing is we, we, we look at them as part of the liabilities of what it costs to live in an urban environment. That we look at someone who is homeless and say, that is the moral tax we pay to have fancy buildings and sports teams and beaches and all the other things that make LA great. And when we look at people as a moral tax, we forget about who they are and what they were created for. 
every time I've met someone who's experienced homelessness, especially unhoused homelessness, what we know about them is that they've experienced deep levels of trauma, sometimes two or three times over. Traumatized because they couldn't make it work for whatever reason. Traumatized because they are victims of violence. Traumatized because they came out to their parents and their parents kicked them out of their house. And then you spend one night on the street without protection, without a roof, without a wall, without someone watching your back, you're traumatized again. All it takes is one night on the street. And what we know from statistics, the longer someone is unhoused, the longer it takes for them to agree to come back into shelter. And the stereotype that we see and we hear about and the way people talk about people experiencing homelessness is not who a homeless person is, but in many ways is the shell of the person that we see after months, weeks, years of trauma. Susan, so if, if we begin to see the homeless, not for what they look like or not for what we stereotypically think them as or as statistics or as part of the moral tax, and you start to see them as human beings who have been traumatized very deeply, they become partners to us in building the better society that God has dreamed for us and that we have decided to endeavor as Americans to make life more perfect for more people that live in our borders. Thanks. Um, Susan, I, I wanted to build on what the rabbi said. Um, you had told me that just being on the street, and this goes back to the need for temporary housing right. that Dana talked about, it's just all consuming. When you're on the street, you can't think about anything else but your day-to-day -day survival. Um, right. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. I, finish your question. I'm sorry. Well, I guess my question is I'm seeing so many questions in the chat about, about two things. Um, one is about, you know, there's this idea that the homeless, there's, there's this preponderance of mental illness among the homeless that makes it, you know, difficult, if not impossible, to find solutions or find, you know, adequate solutions. And the other is that there's a large percentage of the homeless, this, again, these are questions in the Q&A, that don't want to leave the streets, that, are the, that want to be on the streets. And was that your experience, either of those things? So, um, I, if, I, if I can, I just want to also point out that um, uh, when I uh, was able to find out you know, where I needed to go to get assistance. I uh, uncovered a really troubling uh, reality, which is that in or there's so much need that the system that everyone, everyone is experiencing homeless, that's input, their, their input into it to, you know, for, to, uh, it's like prior, it decides priorities for the next available housing slot. It, you have to be deemed chronically homeless, which means that you have to spend a year uh, unhoused uh, before you you really have any priority in the system or you can even you, before you're eligible for housing assistance uh, and um, that's because the need is so great and so that uh, is it a really tr troubling reality that I came I was already traumatized from the domestic violence then I was wait had to wait a year so I was deemed chronically homeless, and then I could get into a, a you know, uh, transitional housing. And so I think that um, I just want people to be aware that you, you know, it, that there are some things coming into into the pipeline. There's something called like, for example, well, there's rapid rehousing, and there's a domestic violence rapid rehousing. So if today the same thing happened to me, there is a chance that I would I could go straight from knocking on the door of a housing provider, right, and get within a short time into a two or three year uh, uh, temporary stay at a domestic violence rapid rehousing. And then hopefully by that time, there might be some more housing available. Uh, but I, that doesn't address your question. I just wanted to make sure people are aware of that reality, mm. that the, the sheer volume of people makes everyone who, who becomes homeless, it, you know, you, it, it makes it worse, it's pathologizing. It, it makes it worse for us because we have to wait that year. But there's, you know, there's no easy solutions to any of that. Um, 
So my experience of the people that I uh, saw that I uh, uh, got to know outside was that, um, again, the mo majority of people, uh, of course, want to be housed. I think that is a myth. That is a, a mythology, a common one that people like it out there. No one likes it out there. Now, it could be a function of a mental illness or, or a gentleman that I knew, he had been experienced many years in prison. And the idea of living in, in uh, someone else's place where he had to live under their rules was not something he could do. So yes, he preferred to be outside for a certain amount of years. And then he too became, uh, was able to find uh, permanent supportive housing. So I, I think that um, the, it's the exception, the rare exception and not the rule for people wanting to live out. Who would want to live outside? It is terrible. You know, where I work in downtown, at the Downtown Women's Center, uh, sometimes I work at night and late at night or the overnight shift, and I see the rats running on the streets, you know, in between tents. No one wants to live like that. So please, you know, just put yourself in that person's shoes and you wouldn't want to live like that either. So I think that um, with that set aside, I think that most people want to be housed and most, but there's certain, you know, there's certain people with serious mental illness. But in terms of getting treatment for that mental illness, it is super hard to have any kind of consistent medication regimen. When you're living in a tent, people, you know, if, if people come through and steal things from one another, and also um, when they clean, this, the police come and do a street cleaning, well, they throw out lots of people's documentation and medication and the day-to-day -day struggle to just survive, to just know where you're gonna sleep, how, where you're gonna eat, that is all consuming. And also being 24 seven vigilant. I mean, you have to be totally vigilant all the time of your surroundings, your belongings. It's a full-time job just to not be, um, uh, to not get, uh, you know, to have not things stolen, to just stay your whole and, and, and with your belongings and not get assaulted or, well, that's too strong, but just not get, you know, right. you're hassled. Thinking, you know, hassled, yeah, so. Well, Ron, when I hear Susan talking, it goes back to what you said earlier about the urgency, like people and what Noah said, or what the rabbi said about every day you spend on the streets is it makes it harder and harder to incorporate back into life. And, yeah. and how do we like, first of all, where does the buck stop? Like, how do we as people, 90% of Angelinos or more, according to the LA Times, find this to be the biggest problem in their city. You can't get 90% of people to agree on anything in this country. Mm -hmm. We agree. So who, who, whose buttons do we have to press that aren't being pressed? Well, first of all, uh, again, thank you so much. I'm so, so happy that uh, Susan is, is with us today uh, to really share her story and, and her experience, because often in so many conversations that I've been a part of that involve uh, issues of, uh, of people who are unhoused and homeless, uh, you don't hear enough of those stories. That's, it's absolutely uh, crucial. Uh, in terms of where the buck stops, the, the, the problem is that we have in, in Los Angeles area, and, and mind you, uh, homelessness is, is a problem that is experienced throughout our nation, although it's most acute in LA. Uh, only New York has a larger number of uh, those experiencing homelessness, but uh, the number that they have that who are on the streets is not as great as ours is. Part of that is weather, part of it is other factors. But you've got the role of the city, you've got the role of county, you've got the role of, of LASA, the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority. You've got many different parties. You've got the state, you've got uh, uh, HUD, uh, housing and urban development, and it's just so kind of all over the place that there isn't anybody with whom the buck stops. And I, I don't know that there is really uh, that's, that's, by the way when you just said it. per se, but uh, you look at at Lhasa for example, and this is something that you know Rabbi Farkas would be able to con uh, to uh, comment more on. Uh, and, and I've been a critic of Lhasa in, in, my, uh, in my audits, but part of the problem is, is that they're, you know, to borrow a Yiddish phrase, nishtahi nishtaher, which means neither here nor there. Uh, they don't exactly have the power to do everything that they would need to do. Uh, 
Uh, and so here we are in this situation. But, but I also wanna add that uh, when we look at what are temporary, but I think necessary steps at this moment, uh, really providing people with opportunities just for hygiene, for bathroom use, for showers, for doing laundry. I, I think about myself, even if I, a couple of days wasn't able to take a shower or, or do laundry or have a place to use the facilities, what would that be like for my own mental health, for any of ours? Uh, we have to uh, solve that problem. And that problem is again, solvable much more quickly. Safe parking, um, temporary housing solutions, be they trailers or prefab, uh, bring back boarding homes, uh, which uh, were uh, very popular years ago and imperfect, but actually there were some great benefits to them. Um, you mentioned, uh, Dana mentioned uh, properties owned by government entities. We, the city of LA, are the largest owner of real estate in LA. We own 7,000 distinct parcels. Now, mind you, some of them are unbuildable and some of them are parks and municipal buildings, but imagine what we could do with that. Let me, uh, let me and, just stop you. Let me just yeah. stop you there, Ron, because I wanted to ask Dana, as long as you're on that point, because it was one of my questions. Let's say you have these 7,000 parcels. Um, Dana, I'm sure you've looked into this. How many people could be housed on those parcels if we had our act together? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, it, we could easily house the 70,000 people who are unsheltered now. That, that would be uh, a Seriously. draw. The, oh, yes. We could do that on the school land housing. We could do it on the land that Metro owns. I, I really feel like it's not a land shortage. It's a matter of conviction. Um, you know, just uh, we, we should remember that the carceral system that pushes people from prison to homelessness and then basically criminalizes homelessness again is a huge part of this problem. And if you think about it, the fact that we have uh, something like 150,000 people that we house basically in cages in prison at a cost of $80,000 a year, like that is a, an equation that is immoral. We, we need to redirect the millions of dollars that goes into imprisoning people to Alien. actually house them in ways that allows them to lead full lives. And because of the prison industrial system, we've closed, we've, we've turned a blind eye to that part of the system that really uh, is a racist anti-black uh, system. So, you know, we're right now at City Lab working with LA County to try to find ways to uh, convert our whole planning and zoning system in the county to become uh, more just, more equitable, and less uh, racist. And all of these things together are part of, uh, you know, a kind of movement, I think. So instead of thinking of individual solutions, we really need to take the blind eye that so many of us have turned towards our unhoused neighbors and turn that into like activism. Could I just tell one story? Which sure. uh, like the rabbis, it really brought it home to me because I was working with a really progressive uh, high school that had a huge um, problem with an encampment. They, they saw that it was a huge problem with an encampment under the freeway near them. And though they were very sympathetic to the people who lived there, they, their students were uh, insecure coming to school, so much so that some of them were coming armed ca to campus. And when you met the people who lived in the encampment, they were afraid of the students because they were coming to campus uh, armed. So there was this kind of uh, showdown where no one really spoke to anyone. And when we talked to the people who lived in the encampment, they had lived there from four to seven years, all of whom were just waiting to get into housing. And they took care of each other like a community and applauded when each person would get permanent housing and take care of each other if there were drug or mental health issues. And in fact, they lived in their encampment longer than some of the neighbors in the suburban adjacent community who had never met them. And so the idea that we don't talk to our neighbors is part of this 
ungrounded fear that they are others. And I think, you know, from Susan's story to the stories that we all know from when we've actually had friends or family or acquaintances that we've gotten to know more closely, it's just a horrible period of someone's life. And to restore the dignity there is what housing can do, but also what just general empathy can do. Where was that? Where, where, where was this um, underpass? What high school is that? On Hoover and the high school is the um, Camino Nuevo High School where they're really now working to build new community ecologies with all of the people who live there. It's a really model program, I think, and the uh, schools are, the school uh, administrators are doing a fantastic job uh, of trying to reach out to make this a much more settled kind of ecology. Ron, you said something that I didn't want to, I didn't want to pass over um, when I asked you where the buck stops and you said there really isn't anyone with whom the buck stops. And that seems to be, I mean, that is just a recipe as we know in a family, in a business, that is a recipe for disaster and we're living that disaster. How, I, I mean, how can that be? And I, and I wondered, Noah, if that was your, uh, Rabbi, if that was your experience as well from from dealing from the loss of side of things that they're just, and, and, and Dana, and, and to all of you, I mean, when you have a project that you wanna get through, when you have a program or, or you wanna do, I mean, how do we, how do we just, how do we find the person who's, the people who are responsible here and hold them accountable? Uh, do you, uh, Ron, controller, do you mind if I answer first and then please pick up the pieces of whatever I break? Cause I'm sure I'm not gonna say it right. <laughs> please, uh, my experience is that you put a lot of pieces together, not break them. Thank you. Uh, well, li listen, uh, the agency that I've been appointed to is called the Los Angeles Homelessness Services Authority, which is a funny name because it um, doesn't have much authority, to be totally honest with you. Uh, we receive tax funding from a uh, number of sources. Many sources filter that, have to braid a lot of these funding sources together and then issue them to subrecipients in, in the forms of grants and other programs to get money to the street. I will tell you this, uh, uh, LASA has come a very long way since I started. I know the controller likes to uh, pick on it a bit, but I, I welcome the criticisms because sometimes they're deserved. When I first started, it, we were 100 days uh, in terms of processing money from in, inside the pipe to out of the pipe. And uh, since I've been at LASA and I'm now chair of the finance committee, that, that turnaround is about 14 days, which is uh, better than almost any other government agency in, in the country. But I'll give you, give you a story about why I think this is a real, why I think the structure is real problematic. I am trying to push LASA right now to close out the funding from 2017 from HUD, from the net federal government. And we can't do it. We can't do it because we are waiting for subrecipients to invoice us properly, to give us the right paperwork. They're not capable of doing it. So we can't go back to HUD and close out what's called this HUD NOFA, this notice of funding. Um, and so therefore we're stuck on the balance sheet holding money that we can't get to the street because we're not being, we don't have the right technical assistance for people who are on the ground. And we work unfortunately with an administration currently that doesn't have a lot of room for grace when it comes to these kinds of things. So uh, we're really stuck and NASA is stuck in the middle. And you're going to ask why LASA was created out of a joint powers authority because the city and county were jointly sued by a group of subrecipients to create that place where the buck stops. But what resulted out of the JPA, the joint powers authority, is an administration that is stuck in the middle that gets picked on by every elected official when things don't go the way that they want and isn't praised when things do go the way that they want. So there has to be a governance conversation about what the LASA commission is, what it's meant to do. Um, you know, our commissioners don't have subpoena power. We don't have power over the budget. We only have a power to approve a budget, but not to create it. And so um, much of the funding that comes into LASA is not discretionary spending. And so our job is, and it all comes in with different levels of administrative costs that mm -hmm. much of it has to be renegotiated and sort of braided together by, by the administration at LASA and then to get that money out as quickly as possible. Um, one last story, and I promise I'll turn it over just to show you this problem. Project Room Key, which was the uh, brilliant idea 
to rent out during COVID all the uh, hotel rooms possible to get people off the streets. Lhasa at one point was having to front most of the money for that cost, waiting for the county and the city and state to pay us back. And our, many of our subrecipients had to take out lines of credit to pay their own employees, which means they're paying money on top of money because we were waiting for funding from the various city, county, and state authorities. So that is an example of if the buck doesn't stop somewhere, it costs more and it moves slower and we can't get people off the street. Ron, if, if, if Dana is saying we have enough land now to house every single homeless person, I'm asking you, who do we have to say, get it done? Just do it, we want it done. Well, first of all, in terms of the land, and look, I, I've mapped every single government-owned property uh, in the Los Angeles area, owned by the city, the county, federal government, state, uh, metro, the school district, uh, and I'm not going to suggest that every property is appropriate for uh, for use for housing or for uh, housing for those experiencing homelessness. But imagine if we just even take a fraction of some of those properties and, and we put them to that use. And, and I agree with, uh, with Dana on this. And also just if you look at ADUs, accessory dwelling units, um, this is a relatively easy way to create uh, more units. I, I happen to have uh, family members, they are both architects, okay? Um, one of them is also an MBA and an expert in planning. It has been a year and a half and they still can't get their ADU properly permitted. And if they can't manage to get it done, imagine what the, the typical Angelino experiences. And uh, that is another way that you are able to create more uh, housing more quickly. But I, I wanted to get back to uh, what Rabbi Farkas said, and, and I couldn't agree with him more. And uh, the, the audits and the reports that we've put out uh, point out that there's a need for a uh, change in governance when it comes to uh, Talasa. And uh, it is indeed uh, unfair to, uh, to be very critical of an agency that sometimes doesn't have the power to fix the problems uh, that have been uh, tossed in its lap. And governance is not a very sexy subject, but it's really, really key if we are going to, uh, to find a, a better way for uh, the buck to stop. We also need much more flexibility from the federal government. Uh, and, and from the state, I believe, there, there, there are ways that uh, they can be very helpful to us. Uh, and when you look at the models and, and the way that we get money from HUD and from other sources, uh, we could really use that flexibility. And we, in our own city, need to get rid of the a massive amount of bureaucracy that we have so that we can utilize properties, be they publicly owned or be they in the private sector, uh, to make a, uh, a much bigger difference and, and, and get people off the street. It may be temporary at first, but as a, as a first step to getting them into permanent housing. Well, a couple of questions that came up. Um, one is um, people say, well, if you do that, I wrote a piece about all oh, 350 acres. I, I see Sam Yebri's on this call and, and he, he reminded me of it, about 350 acres near LAX um, that's, that's open, that could be used. And one of the pushbacks I got is if we do that, then everybody's gonna dump their, ho their homeless people in LA, other, other municipalities, it will become a magnet for homeless. That was, it wasn't an answer, it wasn't something I expected, but I, I certainly got that. How do you answer that argument that you don't wanna do too much for homeless because then you become a magnet for homeless. It really seems to be a thought out there. You know, it, it's a misconception that if we build affordable housing, we're going to have a kind of vortex of uh, people with affordability needs, we already have that vortex and they're living on our sidewalks. So, you know, when they first built public housing in the United States, they built it without any insulation around the hot water pipes or any cabinet doors on the cabinets because they didn't want people to get too comfortable living there because they were, you know, it was an absurd way of thinking. I mean, the, the idea that we wouldn't build housing because it would be so good that people would come to live there is just a, a false logic. Of course, we can build by the airport and we could build there and in uh, you know dozens of other sites. The, the key is that we not only build there, but we have to start somewhere. And until we, I think, get top-down support 
for that construction so that the bottom up resistance has to wait and say, okay, how can we uh, make this fit within our community? Not how can we stop this within our community? I don't think we're going to get very far. Uh, Ron, who is, you know, I want to go back to this question because I'm getting a lot of feedback in the Q&A. Who is the most powerful person in Los Angeles when it comes to setting homeless policy and making things happen? Who? Hmm. I'm trying to think of who that person is. <laughs> and uh, uh, I am having a real challenge of, of telling you who that is because uh, look, uh, in, in the city of Los Angeles, uh, we have uh, a, a mayoralty that is not as strong as uh, in other cities. For example, when you're mayor of New York, you're mayor of the five boroughs and, and you got a lot of power. Uh, in Los Angeles, uh, the city charter gives it to uh, the 15 council members, each with their own fiefdom and, uh, and a painful process of approval that goes through each of those uh, council members. Um, you've got the County Board of Supervisors. Uh, you have uh, so many different parties, uh, each with their own little slice of power. But uh, in the final analysis, and, and I'd love the take of, of the other uh, of the others who are uh, on this Zoom call, uh, I don't know that there is any, uh, any one uh, party. Having said that, I think each of them uh, have the ability to exercise uh, a lot of the bully pulpit uh, to, uh, to move forward a, uh, uh, a more urgent agenda. Well, uh, um... can I just share one thing with sure. you? It's just that I, uh, when I was looking for other housing, you know, to move into, I was looking for senior housing. And there is a, a very large pipeline of the HHH housing that hasn't come online yet, but a lot will come online in 2021 and 2022. I mean, I wish the LASA would take more credit for the things that, that, that they do well, you know, and that, and for the things that they've allowed, you know, that they've helped manage to come into uh, fruition. Same thing with the county and the city. It's almost like um, it's, this is gonna be a long process. You know, it took a long time to get here, to get to this point. And, and I think that maybe level setting expectations of this, you know, very generous citizens who approved H and HHH that, you know, it, it's not gonna get better right now, but it's going to get incrementally better. And here are some of the lives that are being saved and being changed and people who are exiting and, and also understanding what the rabbi said that we need to look at the systemic issues that, that end up in the, you know, this is a long process. And I don't think anyone is served by thinking it's gonna be shorter. And, um, and really there's so much, there's so many complexities about how people end up in this vortex of vulnerability that, you know, maybe, um, I, I don't know. It's just about level setting the expectations because I, I understand people are frustrated and I get it, I, you know, and, but we have to be realistic. It's, it's not going to be a quick fix and anything that is a quick fix, run away from. I, I, I wanted to just say that uh, on the one hand, I, I agree with that. On the other hand, uh, I think we have to perhaps raise our expectations. Well, in, in you can do that, both. Uh, uh, in that I look at uh, uh, Triple H and by the way, Triple H has not been the, uh, uh, the bailiwick of, uh, of Lhasa, it's uh, HCID, which is the Housing and Community right. Investment Department of the City of Los Angeles. But again, it's been four years since $1.2 billion worth of bonds were authorized. Of that, uh, mm -hmm. only uh, $330 million of bonds have actually been floated. Um, of that amount, only about half of that has actually been spent at this point. So the vast majority of that $1.2 billion is committed to a variety of different projects, uh, mm -hmm. the vast majority of which have not uh, even been fully approved or broken ground. Uh, and so I, I think it's perfectly reasonable for people to have higher expectations of how this would have performed. Now, mind you, for those people who have moved into a unit that has been completed, it is life altering. Uh, however, 10,000 units uh, were uh, supposed to be built. And as I mentioned, uh, at this moment, uh, what we have is uh, a, a number of only a couple hundred.
that have actually been completed. Exactly. We have to we have to close soon. It's I can't believe an hour's gone by. I could spend another yeah. hour easily with you all. Um, but but I kind of want to close with this, which is we're facing the end of the coronavirus pandemic. We're facing the prospect of many more homeless people, much more economic dislocation, all these systemic problems that you've all talked about getting worse, not better in the next year. Um, if you could pick out one thing, maybe two, but preferably one, because each of you is only going to have a couple second, couple minutes. Um, what's the most effective thing we could do now to try to get ahead of this the homeless problem in 2021 instead of farther, follow, falling further and further behind. Um, Danny, you wanna go first? Well, it's the right question. Uh, and the most important thing we can do now is prevent more people from falling into homelessness when all of those evictions come around. And I think we do that in part by uh, extending the restrictions on evictions and by trying to get as many of the already built spaces like motels and hotels and office spaces into an adaptive reuse uh, model so that the people that are unsheltered can have some shelter. Okay. Uh, Rabbi. Uh, I think there are three things that have to happen. Number one, there has to be a continued moratorium on evictions, but that has to include relief for land landlords and landowners. So the banks have to get involved with which is the second one I would say is to write down debt, uh, both personal debt and debt on behalf of landlords so that they can feel like they can maintain another quarter or two of uh, helping these folks out. And then third, and I think, you know, for me, in my perspective, most formally and, and as, as a rabbi is that we have to continuously uh, reset our souls to, to see these folks as human beings deserving of our attention and our help. And uh, if we, we, whenever the economy goes south, and whenever there's a recession, there's a tendency to be a little heroic in the beginning, but really be disillusioned about halfway through and only try to take care of you and your own, as opposed to being uh, having some more grace and reaching out to people who, who really need help. And that, to me, that attitudinal shift is probably going to be as important as any policy shift we come up with. Thanks. Uh, controller? Uh, definitely help for renters. Help for uh, many homeowners as well. Uh, I've seen estimates that there are several million loans in America right now uh, that are in default. And uh, at some point, you're going to see, uh, I'm afraid, uh, potentially a foreclosure crisis. I hope that's not the case. Uh, but that may very well be uh, around the corner for 2021 and looking at a whole variety of interim solutions for people right now. It can be safe parking, it can be temporary housing, it can be uh, boarding houses, it can be uh, dedicated mental health facilities, shared units, uh, micro units, uh, ADUs, uh, prefab, you name it. Use it all to help get a massive number of people off the streets and into a better uh, place where we can get them into a more permanent uh, housing solution. Susan, we'll end with you. What, what, what do you pick as kind of the most effective thing we can do to get ahead of the problem for 2021? It's a very complex situation, but I think that's a little of um, uh, what, what I'm hearing the other panelists say as well, is that um, I think that ultimately, while, as we're waiting for the permanent supportive housing to come online, we do need interim solutions. But we have to remember that everybody, that there's several different types of populations that make up our housing, our most vulnerable citizens, our neighbors. So we can't, there's no cookie cutter. So that's why we need all the little different flavors the different types because, you know, domestic violence survivors need their needs, their situations have to be very, very different than uh, perhaps a, a parent with a child and different than someone who's recovering from uh, maybe a surgery or, or a, a long-term illness who, from being outside, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of different um, issues. So we have to kind of do both at the same time. And I don't know if the, if the population, you know, if our neighbors have the patients, um, especially during these hard times, but that I think is important. We need to attack both. Thank you. you, you I, know, I want to add one more thing, you. Rob, which is that um, we need to really engage uh, the people who are most experiencing uh, all sorts of uh, challenges 
in helping to find the solutions. I mean, this is a wonderful panel that we have here, but let's also be frank. 70% of those who are on our streets are members of communities of color and they need to be represented at the table. They need to be represented in the decision-making process and they need to be represented in the conversations that we have going forward. Thanks for that. Um, I, I, I got a lot out of this. I really do feel like new ideas, some solutions, some hope. Um, and I just can't thank you enough. Um, Professor Dana Cuff of UCLA, Rabbi Noah Farkas, controller Ron Galperin and Susan Kolkowitz. I am really honored to have spent this time with you and, and all of our, um, all the people who participate in this call, thank you for joining us. So thank you, thank you all. Uh, I will make a video of this. We'll try to do a highlights reel as well. Send it to your friends. There's a lot of ideas here that are worth repeating and um, thank you all and have a great holiday. Thank, thank you all. Thank you very, thank very you much. So, yeah. Thanks. Lovely to chat with you all. Bye-bye. Thank you, Susan. Thank you.